question and thank you very much for every one of the speakers that we had today. And I would like to ask all the speakers that we have today to just kind of turn on their videos to have them on the screen. And I would like to ask uh, all the participants to join me in a round of applause for, for their nice presentations. They did a really nice job today to kind of present what they what they have, and we have lots of kind of interesting discussions. So uh, now we will have a little bit of time for Q and A, and discuss about what are the things that we have and what are the the next steps in this in this field. So let me just stop sharing my screen, and uh, we have the chat space. So those who have questions, please use the chat space to ask questions from the speakers that we have. And meanwhile, if people are interested to basically turn on their video and just ask the question live, that would be an option as well if you have a specific question. And Daria, do we have any question on the chat space that you want to ask speakers? So uh, we had uh, more of a comment followed up by a question of the same person, and I'm still uh, trying to uh, read this. So the comment was new methods for TES are being published, like temporal interference, which is supposed to solve the dose response problem, in, at least in deep brain simulation. But there is no, and I believe uh, uh, this is, uh, should read follow up research published at least by leading teams. And the question um, is, new methods seem to be the best methods for the research and methods by developing and researching current methods will be best path to improve. Do we have any suggestion from the speakers so, here about the temporal in, in interference kind of publication? I'm sure everybody has, has seen that, that interesting publication. I can just comment on that. That I mean, it's a, it's an, it's another variant of TES, and as such, uh, one can uh, can address it with modeling. Um, I don't think the dose response problem has been solved at all with that. Uh, I mean, it's really a budding research field. I think it's an interesting one, but we have to see data, and, and we have to we have the same problems of trying to uh, quantify dose and 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 see what effects it has. Uh, so it's an exciting area, but I think there is there's not there's nothing solved yet there. Quite the contrary, it's just beginning. And we have a question from Anant. Anant, do you want to turn on your video and ask the question live? Definitely. Thank you, Amin. Thank you, everyone, for great talks. Uh, I see a lot of simulation studies and results are showing that individual variations like Evans showed uh, just in last talk, that there are individual variations based on simulations, and which suggests that we should have individual specific stimulation protocols that would have better efficacy. But I, I wonder why don't we see a lot of studies that are using individual specific stimulation and able to show that, OK, we are able to modulate brain activity using measures like fMRI, ASL, or FNIS, or, or whatever brain measurements tools that are being used for that uh, individual specific, uh, using individual specific stimulation protocol based on simulation. Why, why we don't see those more and see more of sim simulation studies? Any comments and suggestions from the speakers? Maybe I can just, it's more of a thought. I think we are all working on them, right? So at least uh, from my point of view, um, I think the retrospective investigation is kind of the first step we can all do in uh, ch checking whether this modeling can explain variability prospectively after the data is acquired and now kind of so I think it's just a uh, work in progress at least for my lab and uh, the people I know and the reality is I mean collecting data from from the kind of real uh, participants 
is really time demanding. Have you, I mean, if you have run a, a kind of a trial, you, you know it, it takes kind of even several years to be able to collect a really large and reasonable database. And so there is always a question in terms of how you narrow down the parameter space of a trial. And then sometimes people collect really nice data, but others, other labs do not have access to that. So there might be an option in terms of thinking in the future within some of the uh, available consortiums right now, for example, within the Enigma consortium, to encourage people who are collecting uh, non-invasive brain stimulation with fMRI to share their databases to basically help others to kind of dig into more the details that we have. As you can imagine, as, as Ghazale presented here, there are multiple ways of exploring the data. And there is always a question in terms of what would be the, the, the best way to do that. And I mean, it's, it's always, I mean, hard to say, which, I mean, there might not be a best way to do something, but it just, what are the, the, the potential ways that you can do that? And can we narrow down the, the exploration to a specific sort of confirmatory analysis? Just to jump in, I have to agree. So um, uh, obviously I talked about two ways that we might be able to behavior, um, to change or individualize stimulation. And we have begun to explore how, whether that indeed changes anything. So for example, talk about how you might simply individualize dose based on simulations. We have in the lab been doing that. Um, but I also, alluded to the fact that there are more than just that component so we haven't begun to piece together every element of individualization to go okay well we can control dose will that you know suddenly drop the variance i doubt it we've got to individualize dose plus montage which we haven't even begun to enter into exploring how to do that and that's just two elements of many elements so it's on the way for sure but i don't think the aha moment Maybe, I'm not trying to be pessimistic, will necessarily be here in the next uh, minute or so. I think there's still more. And, you know, there are so many elements that we discussed today that we need to sort of piece together. There is a question from Mario on Ironside. Mario, do you want to kind of turn on your video and ask your question live or Daria can, you can read the question? Sure. Mario. Can you hear me? Yes. Hello. Hello. Um, yeah, great series of talks. Um, very, very interesting all around. Um, I was, it was actually, um, it had been on my mind while I was watching all of the talks, and it was um, Karis's last question there on her presentation, which really summed it up. It's, you know, it really seems like these optimization efforts are really necessary for removing the variability in, in the various studies that we see at the moment. But, um, yeah, how, you know, it'd be interesting what the other speakers also thought in terms of how do you balance this optimization with the clinical feasibility, ease of use, especially you know with T with TDCS where we're looking at potentially home use? Um, I don't know how um, we translate some of these. Even even you know moving towards a high def montage would that really work with home use? And so my my thought is just like you know how do we balance these things out? And I'd be interested in what other speakers think about that. Okay, maybe I can make a brief comment on that, Maria. So um, I think part of the effort now is to, it's a research effort to, bet, to get a better grasp on the sources of variability for TES uh, and physical modeling is definitely part of that. And maybe physiological modeling as well. And I think the, the vision is that once we understand better the source of variability, we'll be in a better position to, to design optimization montages, optimize montages that maybe won't have to be personalized, but at least we will understand better what it is that we're doing. Uh, so, because you're right, I mean, to, for home, home home deployment of the technology will require simplification of, of some of these of these matters. And one one thing else that might be Maria interesting and and kind of pragmatic is that sometimes I mean the the, the number of factors that we have in the kind of the the brain model that we have, which is going to kind of explain how brain respond to brain stimulation. The model is sometimes so complex. But one of the things that there are, I mean, would give potential is just the, the closed loop paradigms. When we do the stimulation and we do recording and we try to optimize response with those 
over the time in, in multiple kind of rounds of stimulation. And without even going into details, we, we try to kind of start from the best optimum point based on all the modelings that we have. And then we start from that and we try to optimize that in the individual level. So if we can have those sort of closed loop measurement and recording and stimulation in each individual level and find the optimum way of, of doing the stimulation and then using that optimum kind of parameters for developing sort of individualized headset for, for a, a participant or individualized protocol for a participant to be followed in, in home or the next levels in the kind of in the in the uh, kind of outside the scanner kind of intervention mm -hmm. and how that online effect could be translated to offline effect in the future. I mean there are still lots of challenges, but there might be potentials even without solving the entire kind of parameter space of the the brain model that we have, we might be able to find some potentials in terms of kind of optimizing the clinical outcome at the end of the day. Mm -hmm. Any other suggestions from other speakers? And I was going to kind of ask other speakers in terms of what do you think about what will be the next level? I mean, when, when you kind of review the literature during the last 10 years, we have a kind of accumulation of knowledge and understanding about, about how kind of those response relationships should look like. But what will be the next level of uh, experiments or studies that you are looking for and you are hopeful to see? in the next 10 years to have a better understanding about uh, those response relationship in non-invasive brain stimulation. Um, I guess for me, the first wave of uh, electrical stimulation research was really out in the lab, testing montages and seeing what effects we had on behavior, whether that was you know, the, the classic work on motor cortex or even in depression, et cetera, and working memory and, and, and so forth. And then we, we all encountered this big moment where we, we thought, well, we don't see this reliably. And anyone picking up, uh, for example, direct current stimulation, thinking, oh, well, this is such a lovely, little, inexpensive, easy to apply device. Um, I will rep replicate that data and then, you know, throw out my own research. We saw the big problem, which was the lack of replicability. So we've all gone back to our software, you know, to really understand what we're doing. OK, thanks to current phone models, especially we can really understand where is this current going? We, what intensities are we looking at? And this is getting, as you say, to that question of how much stimulation is necessary. What do we need? to expect outcomes. Is there a minimum threshold of current that we need to apply to the neurons we're interested in? Is it not about targeting a region, but appreciating that this is part of a network and therefore being more precise about the network with targeting, et cetera? And we've explored many different parameter spaces in, in that way. So I, I think for me, the next step is we have to get back out into the lab. So we have lots of ideas now but we have not necessarily implemented any of them to see whether they are effective whether we're seeing for example uh, a reduction in variability whether those effect sizes are increasing or the the you know error bars are decreasing or anything like this so for me i think the next phase would be okay we have we have some concepts we have some proposed ideas let's see if they get us any closer to eliminating or reducing this replicability problem. Holly, please. Uh, yeah, I'd like to agree with those points and also add the element of change over time and dynamic changes in the um, brain's response to the stimulation. Uh, one of the challenges we still have in the field of psychopharmacology and understanding dose response is the um, change over time in terms of the receptor kinetics. You know, the dose response function with acute exposure is not the same thing as dose response function with chronic exposure. And then even if the person, let's say, responds to the stimulation, why do they relapse or why do they not relapse? So understanding those changes over time in terms of chronic effects versus acute effects, I think is going to be very important. Also, we have all of the types of brain health applications that we'd like to apply brain stimulation for, each of which may have different dose response functions and dynamic effects over time. And then we have all the individual factors that 
influence dose response uh, functions, uh, one of them being age and neurodevelopment. And that's a moving target too, because our subjects are, are growing and changing over time. Um, and so I, I, to answer Hamid's question, I, I think you, you need a series of, of many more webinars to go deeper into all of these areas. It's infinitely infinite. It, it's a very complex um, and great to see so many great scientists uh, working on these difficult issues. Uh, can I add a little bit of your points? Yes, Hamid? please go ahead. Uh, a little bit from physical point of view, uh, not neurophysiological, what might be also considered is that all these modelings are under, uh, or these macro scale modelings are already done based on the quasi-static approximation, meaning that when you increase the intensity, the electrical field will be, will be increased. Then the question would be that when you want to go for dosage, uh, calculation, adjustment, uh, how? Uh, because these this kind of macro scale modelings are just linear. And then the neurophysiological response are, okay, are linear. If they are not, then these modelings, to what extent they can, they can be used? Another thing is that, again, at the physical level, uh, conductivity uncertainty, uh, at the individual level is there. There are nice studies, for example, by Axel uh, Tilscher from Copenhagen, showing that uh, we don't know the con uh, conductivity of uh, each pa participant. And this has huge impact on the result of electrical field at the, again, physical level. I don't talk about neurophysiology. And uh, just by putting participant inside the scanner, having T1, T2, or whatever uh, anatomy, and then reconstructing the 3D model, uh, we don't know whether this result of electrical field is really valid or not. What is the ground truth? Meaning that, uh, and depends on, uh, against segmentation tools that you use, whether you use SPM, whether you use other methods, FSL, other tools, uh, you will get uh, quite a bit different results at the physical level, again. Meaning that uh, if a model is not valid yet at the physical level, how you want to use it for uh, neurophysiological or behavioral uh, studies which are not uh, I mean, it's it's like bridging the gap between physics and physiology is wonderful, but when there is a ground truth at the physical level, and uh, we are a little bit collaborating with uh, Axel with like a little bit of MRCDI, there are some studies done for validation of modeling, again, at the physical level, but we are very far, in my opinion, to say that, yeah, uh, if you apply one milliampere for these participants, you will get, for example, 0 0.25 volt per meter at this location. Uh, and if you are not sure about it, how you want to use it for those adjustments uh, for, for neurophysiological or behavioral studies. Just one point that is still at the physical level is still your there are too many open questions. If you want to use them for neurophysiology, it is good, but it should be considered as well. Thank you. That's that's nice. And and G, what, what do you think? Do you, I mean, just putting you on the spot. Uh, yeah, I mean, these models all come with varying level of assumptions and level of complexity, uh, and when we report results and interpret results from these models, we have to keep in mind the limitations of these models. Uh, how well is it validated? What are the assumptions on the parameters that we put in? Uh, is it a quasi-static approximation, conductivity assumptions, and the level of segmentation, which leads to accuracy, solver accuracy, and convergence rates and errors. Uh, so all of these are, you know, are sources of error. Um, 
you know, then then the matter is sort of how do you validate it? And, and there are some methods using intracranial recordings and also these MR methods that try to estimate current density from the magnetic field. And these measurements tell us right now that at least on a gross level, we are on the order of magnitude, at least. So we're not way off, we're not 10 times off. Um, and how do you validate it individually? I think we have to do more careful experiments with physiology. Um, perhaps do some source localization experiments, for example, uh, can help to uh, validate these models as well and, and assumptions about conductivity of different tissue. Um, we hope that if we're starting to use these models now, some of these errors will average out uh, across individuals, uh, but of course, it on, that's on a group level, right? So, on an individual level, we, we're still struggling with these assumptions. Other comments and suggestions from other speakers? Well, maybe I can I can add that uh, definitely the models that we have for electrical uh, field modeling, um, the physics part. I think compared to the uncertainty we have on the physiological effects are rather small. <laughs> so, okay, we have plenty of room to improve on both, but uh, for me, the big challenge right now is the physiology, is the, the mechanistic understanding of the effects of the electric field on the, on the brain, which is a uh, much harder problem, I think. And comparing with kind of pharmacological studies, as Holly mentioned, uh, things like even fluoxetin that we use in clinical practice, we know that response to fluoxetin in the first day and the second day in the first week, second week, is totally different because brain would kind of have different levels of receptors to, to fluoxetin over the time, and it changes dynamically over the time. And But we still kind of use fluoxetin in the, in the clinical practice. And it, the interesting thing about what we do for neuromodulation, we have one level kind of ahead of what they have in pharmacological studies because in, they can do PET studies and other things to see kind of receptor binding in different different parts of the brain as well. But we can also do, we can go beyond the just the delivered dose. We can see the level of dose that we have in each individual part of the brain. And I mean, that would be an ideal, another addition that we can, can explore. And there are definitely lots of interesting, exciting things that should be happening. So if there are any other questions or comments from speakers, any last comments or conclusions from the speakers? Daria, do you have any other last comments or suggestions from speakers or any? In the chat, you mean? There is nothing in the chat, but maybe okay. I can uh, add my thought. I was thinking uh, while you discussed this, I think uh, uh, that's basically uh, also showing that both um, approaches, kind of the physical computational modeling approach and the neurophysiological more empirical approach can also benefit from each other and uh, researching, uh, investigating these relationships, even if we still have some uh, uh, pitfalls of models or not, or, or some open questions are still also helping the Models. So if we find those uh, associations, this is also informing, can also inform the physical side of the models. And I think that's what Sven uh, in the beginning mentioned, that we're uh, basically not interested in the E-fields uh, per se, we're interested in the effects. And I think this also underlies how important it is to, um, to have multi-model investigations. So have all the kind of uh, MRI data and uh, also structural and functional behavioral data and modeling all in one study to be able to um, infer how specific these effects are also um, for one side for one particular subject group or anything. So that's my take home. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Daria. Thank you very much. And kind of uh, I should thank all the speakers that we have today and all the 24 speakers that we had in these two webinars. The good thing is that we recorded all those kind of four hours of webinars and we'll provide kind of, we would put them on, on YouTube so people will have access to that. And now we have a started discussion in terms of how we can collaboratively develop some like a roadmap on how those response studies could be kind of 
expand it in the future and how we might be able to collaborate on that side. So hopefully that would be the next step. So hopefully the kind of the discussion would not end up to this webinar. So we are going to continue the discussion and collaboration and we can go back in something like two, three years and review what we already have in terms of the new advances that we have in the field. And hope, I'm hopeful that this sort of network collaboration at the international level, we already have speakers from multiple different countries today. So I'm hopeful that these collaborative networks would help us to be able to push the field forward. So the, the activities that we are going to have in terms of the networking activities, I'm hopeful those activities would kind of end up to a better understanding and finding new treatments for different psychiatric and neurologic disorders that people are suffering from around the world. So the last kind of slide, the next webinar would be on April 6th, and we are going to discuss about individualized brain imaging for individualized neuromodulation. So that's an interesting discussion. And if you have a specific kind of speakers in mind, if you want a specific kind of person to be invited, if you have a specific piece of data you want to share, uh, we would be happy to receive your suggestions to, and we are right now planning for the webinar. So hopefully you will be able to join us for that webinar. And thank you very much everyone for joining us today. Hopefully we will continue the discussions on emails and we will continue to collaborate. Have a, have a super nice day. Thank you for organizing. Thank you. Thank you very much. Bye. Bye. Thank Bye. you.